Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so I hope you all finish your quiz. So let us start uh, our lecture. Okay, any, anything that you would like to ask before we begin today's uh, topics? So last time we talked about um, time complexity. In time complexity classes, we also talked about uh, we also talked about asymptotic notation. And we talked about the class field. Any questions uh, from any of these topics? Um, sir? Yes. Can you please explain the small o notation again? Okay. Okay, so let me talk about small notation. Uh, so the small notation says that suppose we have two functions f and g. Okay, and these two functions f g are the functions from set of natural numbers to real numbers, positive real numbers. Okay, so in that case we say We say f of n is in small o of g of n if, okay? So the first thing that we, the way we define the small o is, is, is basically using the limits. That is, if f of n, if we find the quotient of f of n and g of n and take the limit when n tends to infinite, then this is equal to zero. This is the first and the most correct definition. I mean, most unambiguous definition. There's another definition, but that there is some uh, problem with that definition. And that uh, that is because uh, there is a possibility of confusion. Uh, and that definition actually is very similar to the defi definition that we use for big O, right? So what is that definition? Uh, that definition says that we have two functions f and g. Both these functions are from set of natural numbers, positive real numbers. And we say that f of n is in a small o of g of n. Okay. Uh, it is in a small g of n. Uh, okay. If for every, for every real number, c, greater than zero, every positive real number C, okay, a number exists and zero such that this function f of n is strictly less than the C time, this constant C times G of n for all values of n greater than equal to n zero. Okay, so, so this definition says that, that f of n must be strictly less than c times g of n, and it should hold for each and every possible value of c. So it means that we cannot just change the value of c to make it the other way, right? So if you remember the definition of, uh, of big O, so let's say, I have a fun, uh, let's say I have a function a, and this function is in big O of b, then it means that, it means that there exists c, and n zero such that such that a of n is less than equal to c times b of n for all values of n greater than equal to n zero. So these two definitions look similar, but they are different. 
So the difference, first difference is that we have uh, less than, strictly less than here, while we have less than equal uh, in, in this definition. Second, and, and, and the bigger difference is that we have for all, for every real number C greater than zero. Over here, we, we just have there exists C zero. There exists C and N zero, okay? So over here, C is again uh, uh, greater than zero, but we just need to find one such C. We don't have to show that it holds for each and every possible value of C. So there is a difference. Is it fair? Yes, it's clear. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so yes. How would we go about finding uh, C or N naught? Um, what, what do you mean by finding C or N naught? Like, for example, if we have uh, some polynomial equation like 5N cube plus 2N square or something. So, uh, okay. how would we find so let's give me the, C or N naught? Give me the example 5. 5n cube okay. uh, plus 2n square uh, minus 6n plus 5. Okay, and what about g of n? So the big O of this would be n cube, right? Okay, so let's see n cube. Yeah, right. So how would we find okay. c and n naught? Fine. So we know that f of n is in big O of g of n. We know for sure. This is true. It means that 5n cubed plus 2n squared minus 6n plus 5 must be less than or equal to some c, some constant time n cubed, right? For all values of n which are greater than or equal to n0. We do not know what is this n0 right now, but we will find it out. So one way to do it is try to plot this function and try to plot this in, in, in cube as well. And then see what are the different values of C for which the inequality will hold. The other way is that you find possible values of the C, right? So in this particular case, you can figure it out that the C cannot be less than five because if C is less than five, then whatever that is on, on, on the left-hand side is not less than the right-hand side, right? So it has to be greater than five because we have a constant five here, a test here while this, this is C. So you need to, to uh, apply some tricks here and figure out that what could be the possible values of C. In some cases, it is easy to find. In some cases, it is not easy. It's not direct, but we need to try a few, few techniques. Okay. okay, sir. Anyway, so any other question? Okay, so last time we defined a class, which we call the class P. So let me define this class P one more time, and then we will uh, begin our discussion from for today's class. So we say that this class P is basically the collection of languages. Uh, so, and, and that collection of language is basically the, the, the collection of all possible languages, which are decidable in polynomial time on a deterministic single tape theory machine. So for example, if I say that this P is, is the set, it's a big set, it's a collection. It's a collection of languages. Then for every P, for all languages P, there exists a single tape deterministic Turing machine M such that M decides. Okay. So in this collection, in this collection of languages, for each and every language that we have in this collection, we can find out or there exists at least one Turing machine which decides this language. And not just any Turing machine, but that Turing machine has to be single tape and deterministic. Well, single tape is not important over here, but deterministic is important. Why single tape is not important? Because we have already seen uh, that the computational model of multi-tape and single tape are polynomially equivalent. So, so 
So whatever that you can do on a multi-tape tuning machine, you can do it in, on a single tape tuning machine with just an additional uh, polynomial factor, right? So it will take a little bit more time, but it's still polynomial. So we say that all those languages which are in this class B are called polynomial time uh, languages, right? Or we can we can say that all uh, every problem that that exists in this collection P is a problem for which there exists a polynomial time algorithm to solve it. So we can look at this class P from two perspectives. One perspective is, is as a collection of languages and the other perspective as a collection of problems, right? And we already have, we already have seen that it is possible to change um, a problem or to rewrite the problem in, in, in the context or in, in terms of language. So they are interchangeable. So for every problem that we can think of, for which there exists, a, uh, there exists a polynomial time algorithm, then that problem will be in this class B. Or for every language for which you can, uh, such that that language can be decided by a single tape deterministic Turing machine, that language will be here, okay? So this set P is not a small set, it's, it's, it's a huge uh, collection of languages, right? And more formally, we can say that this P uh, is basically collection of all such problems or languages which can be decided in time in power k for every possible k. Right. Okay, clear? And uh, then we talked about two important properties of this class P, and that is P is invariant for all models of computation that are polynomially equivalent uh, to the deterministic single tape Turing machine. And P roughly corresponds to the class of problems that are realistically solvable on a computer, right? So anything that is not in P is usually, I mean, that problem is something that we cannot solve uh, on a computer in reasonable time, in, in, yeah, in some reasonable time. So let us talk about some of the examples of the problems that are in the class P. Okay, so we have already seen so many problems which are in class P and so many languages which are in class P. Uh, for example, if I say A is a language that uh, is basically 0n, 1n, such that n is greater than or equal to zero, then this language A belongs to P. Why? It is, it is a part of class P because we can uh, we can construct a Turing machine uh, which decides A in polynomial time, right? So it, it is it is in problem over there. So there are other problems as well which are in class B. So let's talk about some of those problems. And I will talk about problems and then we will convert those problems in, in terms of uh, the language theory and try to see if we can apply the same technology. Suppose G is a graph. Suppose G is a directed graph. So if G is a graph, then this graph must be a set of vertices and set of edges uh, between those vertices. Now suppose there are two vertices S and T from this graph, okay? So we say, uh, we can ask a question like, is there a path in G from the vertex S to vertex T, a directed path. Okay, so this is the question. And this question is basically in terms of uh, description in if we, when we use the language of problem, right? Uh, but we can use the formality of the language theory as well, and we can define this problem as, so let's call this problem path problem. So we say that the path problem is a problem uh, in which we have three things, the graph, the, the vertex S and vertex T, okay? And we know that when we pass G, this G basically is V and E. So we are basically indirectly passing both V and E when we are passing G. So, when we have, um, when we pass these things, 
when you pass these three things as the input, uh, we ask this question. So we say that G, first of all, G is a directed graph. Okay. That has a directed path. from S to Now this question that we have here can be considered. So if I say that this is a question Q, then this question Q is basically is a membership question. Right, it's a, it's a membership question for, for the class B. Sorry, for the class path, for the language path, sorry. So it's a membership question, right? So if we can answer this question, it means that we can answer this membership query. And if we can answer membership query, we can answer the question. So, so the question is very clear. So given a graph, so suppose I give you a graph, suppose this is a graph G, and there are many vertices here. So this is the vertex, this is the vertex, this is the vertex. And there's a vertex S here, and there's a vertex T here. So the question is, uh, is there a path from this vertex S such a way that there is a path here, right? So there might be other paths as well, but we are not interested. Or there might be other paths from S which are which do not lead to T. And there might be some other paths from other vertices which come to T, uh, but they are not emanating from S. So the question is, is there a path starting from S, going all the way till T, okay? If such a path exists, the answer is yes. If, such, if there is no such path, we say, the answer is no. So we can write this problem as problem, or we can rewrite this problem in the language formalism, and we say that path is the language which consists of strings, okay? And each and every string is basically in three parts, the first part is the description of the graph. The second part is the uh, the name of the source vertex. And the third part is the name of the target vertex, such that there exists a path from the vertex S to vertex T in this graph G, okay? So whenever we send any input to, to, this, to this language, uh, for example, if there exists a Turing machine which decides this, this language, then whenever we, uh, whenever we send any input W, uh, to that, uh, for example, if the machine is, is Turing machine is M, uh, then this M will check, if you'll say yes or no, this M will check that given this description G and given the name S and T, is there a path from S to T? If, if there is a path, if there exists a path from S to T, the answer will be yes, or it will accept the, the input, otherwise it will reject. So this is the decider. Okay, so we conclude that this path problem is in the class B. Okay. Can you prove it? So if I say that there's a theorem it says that path is in P, then you prove it. Sir, so for this condition to be true, uh, we have to check if uh, the TM for this path, the problem path, um, has a polynomial time, right? Yes. So how do we uh, know that a particular TM has a polynomial time? Like how do we calculate it? So how do, yes, anyone, can anyone answer this question? I think we covered it in last class. So can anyone answer this question? How do we know the time complexity of a Turing machine? Yes, anyone. The number of steps? Yes, that's, that's exactly the answer. So whenever we have a Turing machine, 
the Turing machine, I mean, we, we input some string through the Turing machine, right? Let's say W is the string that Turing machine takes in. Now the answer, since the Turing machine is a decider, so we are only talking about deciders, not recognized. So the Turing machine is decider. After some time, it will, uh, it will produce an output, uh, which it will either accept, after some time it will either accept or it will reject. So it will come to a stop, right? It will halt after some time. So when the machine halts, okay, when the machine halts, uh, we check that how many steps it, um, I mean, took in accepting that string. It could take one, one step or two steps or five steps or 10 steps or 100 steps or any number of steps, right? Then we see that what is the relationship between the number of steps and the size of the input. So for example, if the string is W that we send as the, uh, so for example, if we have the Turing machine M here and we send W as a string, it will either accept or it will reject because it's a decider. So once it either accepts or reject, when it comes to hold, uh, we will check that what are the number of steps by M, okay? And we count the number of steps by M as a function of N where N is the size of the input, okay? The length of the input. Now this f of n could be, let's say two times n. This f of n could be, uh, let's say three times n squared my, uh, plus n. It could be anything. It could be n time, two times n times log of n and so on and so forth. So all these are possible. I mean, they, they could be possible uh, functions which actually measure the time complexity of, uh, of, the, of the Turing machine. Okay, so we say that as long as this time complexity is polynomial, that uh, problem which the Turing machine solves belongs to the class B. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so in this problem, in the past problem, we have uh, the directed graph which consists of the vertices, right? So the vertices, yes. will, we will count the length of the vertices over here? So over here, we will count the length of this G, S, and T. Okay, how do we count it? So we are given a graph. And if we have a graph, then how can we represent a graph? We can represent a graph using two things, either adjacency list or uh, adjacency matrix, right? So let's say we have adjacency matrix because it is easier to consider right now. So let, let's suppose there are N vertices. Okay, then we have an N by N matrix. So this N by N matrix will actually be a matrix representation of the graph, right? So if I have N vertices, then N by N matrix means there are N square entries in the matrix, right? One entry for S, one entry for T. So there are N square plus one is the length of length of the input string, right? Length of the input string, okay? Now, if we can come up with an algorithm, if we can come up with, if we can come up with an algo. Sir, uh, so S and T will not be included in uh, the matrix? What? No, S and T are included, but we need to know which from which vertex to which vertex we are talking about, right? So suppose oh, this is the okay. graph, right? These are three vertices. Maybe this is S, this is T, this is U. So this graph is just a directed graph. So the question says that, is there a path, a directed path from S to T, right? So if I say this, this is G and I provide S and T, the answer is yes. But if I provide G and I, I provide T and S, the answer is no, because there is no directed path from T to S or U to S, right? So the answer is yes, the answer is no over here. So we need to provide two additional things that from where, uh, what is the source vertex that we need to find the path from and what is the target vertex 
uh, to which we need uh, to find the path up to, right? So anyway, so if you can come up with an algorithm that runs in polynomial time in the size of, of the input, okay? Then we, we know that, uh, so this algo means TM as well. So if you can construct a TM or an algo, uh, which runs in polynomial time in the size of the input, then it's perfectly fine. For example, uh, you may say the time complexity of this f of n, so let's not use n, let's use some other variable. Uh, let's f of m is 2m squared plus m. It's hypothetical, okay? It is not necessarily correct, it's just hypothetical. Then what is the total time complexity? because the input size is n squared plus two n, right? So we will find out f of n squared plus two n, which will be two times n squared plus two n plus n, which is two n power four plus four n cubed plus uh, four n squared plus n, which is two n power four plus eight n power three, plus eight n square plus n. Okay, so this is still a polynomial of order four. So therefore, therefore this is okay. Okay, but this is just an hypothetical, uh, just this is hypothetical. I'm just saying that if such a thing exists, then we should we would say that this is indeed. But the question remains, can you prove path is indeed? Can you prove this? Can you prove this theorem? Can anyone prove it? Because uh, in exam, we will have similar questions. I will give you a problem, either in the language, I mean, I either described as a language or a problem and, and, and ask you, um, does this language or the problem belong to the class P or not? Yes, can any, anyone prove? So anyway, any ideas on how you would proceed with the proof? Maybe you don't have the complete proof in your mind right now, but maybe you have some good idea that how you, how would you proceed to prove such a, such a theorem, such a result? What should be the first step? Yes, anyone? No one? Sir, uh, we just found n squared plus one. What was that? Was that just the number of steps? Sir, shouldn't we first figure out the steps somehow, like the equation? This was, this was the input size. How would you do that? So the proof, I don't know if you know the proof or no, but in order to show the proof, we need to construct a Turing machine that decides path in polynomial time, right? That, that decides the, the language path in polynomial time. Or you can say that we need to design an algorithm that decides, that checks path is, is in polynomial time. But in any case, you need to construct either a Turing machine or, um, or, a Turing, uh, or, or uh, an algorithm. Now suppose this is the graph that is given, okay? So these are the vertices. How many vertices we have? There are N vertices, okay? Suppose this is S and this is T. So there is a possibility that there is a path from S to T or, and there's the other possibility that there is no path from S to T. But since this is a directed graph, so what we need to do, we start with the vertex S and we mark this vertex uh, somehow. So we say, okay, this is marked, this is visited or we have just explored it. 
then we then we mark each and every vertex that is directly connected by that is directly connected by s all those vertices which are directly connected by s we mark them okay then we pick one of the marked vertex and repeat the same process again for every vertex that is not marked we marked it such that it is connected by one of the marked vertices and we repeat this process we repeat this process till all the vertices are marked okay or there is no vertex where we can reach at that point we see if t is marked or not if t is marked it means that there exists a path from s to d if t is not marked it means that there does not exist a path from s to d now at this point we know that this this is a solution which will work but we need to make sure that the time complexity of the solution is also appropriate since there are only n vertices then even in uh, i mean how many vertices how many edges we can have right so even if it is a very dense graph we know that there will be uh, each vertex will have like n minus 1 edges right so we need to explore all those vertices and all those edges so we need to explore all vertices and all edges suppose m is the number of edges so we need to explore all vertices and all edges in the worst case so the time complexity is n plus m so if you remember it is also the brute force uh, sorry uh, breadth first search right so this is the time complexity of breadth first search. so we can apply a breadth first search over here and breadth first search is a polynomial time algorithm it means that whatever algo that you will come up with which solves this problem or the turing machine that solves this problem will still run in polynomial time right so this can be a uh, this can be uh, linear in terms of the number of vertices or at most quadratic in terms of the number of vertices so which is perfectly fine which is perfectly fine which is still a polynomial therefore this is true and since we came up with such a machine or an algorithm we just need to show that our algorithm is correct and we are done so uh, if for example our dm is also performing other um, steps for example the step where we are marking the node s so will it not be included in the time complexity it, it doesn't matter because we are see I, i just i did not show you what is the exact time complexity i just said o of n plus n so when we use o notations we actually hide so many details right so we we hide so many granular lower level details so n plus m is enough since it's polynomial we are not concerned anything more than that oh okay yeah right so p means polynomial time uh, problems right so, so all all those problems which can be solved in polynomial time on a deterministic turing machine so if it is deterministic if it is polynomial we are good it doesn't matter if it is o of n or of n square or of n cube or of n power 4 it doesn't matter as long as it is polynomial we are good Okay. In in this course, it is good. But if you are doing some uh, course on uh, analysis of algorithms, where you are required to design an algorithm which is efficient, then then yeah, that is not that's not good. Okay. So let me uh, show you one more problem, and I have a theorem which says that relative prime problem is in class b so let me define what is relative prime so we say two integers okay let's say a and b are relatively prime okay relatively prime if the largest integer that evenly divides both a and b is 1 okay for example um let's say we have 20 and uh 50 and 20 and let's say 19 okay 
So we say that 20 and 19 are relatively prime, even though 20 is not a prime number. Uh, 20 and 19 are relatively prime because the highest, the biggest number, which evenly divides both 20 and 19 is one, right? Or in other words, we say that the GCD of 20 and 19 is equal to one. So the question is, relative prime is in P. Can you prove it? Actually, I already have given you the answer, but anyway. Can you prove it? So in order to prove it, again, you need to construct either a Turing machine or an algorithm which, which checks whether two numbers are relatively prime or not. Can you design such an algo or a, or a Turing machine such that it runs in polynomial time? Yes, can anyone do that? So your quiz performance and your class participation do not match. So it seems that you do extremely well in quizzes, but not in class participation. Yes, what you were saying? So I was saying if you make a Turing machine that decides yeah. uh, integers by using the algorithm of GCD, because we know that GCD mm -hmm. uh, takes like integers, right? So what if it takes the same amount of uh, steps for it, for the input? For example, for 20 and 19, assuming it takes 20, maximum it can take like 20 steps, right? So it's always going to be an N number. It will always be polynomial. Oh. That is not, I mean, that's not completely correct actually. So, have you implemented GCD algorithm before? Do you know how, how does GCD work? Sure, yeah. I think we did it once way before in one of our first semester courses. Uh, do we, can we, for example, if we have to take the GCD of two numbers, A and B, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, we will have to check for the remainder, right? Like if we divide yes. A by B, the remainder should be one. Okay. So if we can make a TM for that, check if uh, the remainder is one. Will that work? Well, uh, I'm not interested in, in the algo actual, actual algo right now. I'm interested in uh, the complexity. And how would you how would you go with it? What is the complexity of GCD? Or do you know any algorithm which uh, which does uh, find the GCD? Sir, I don't remember any. I think we have done this. Have you studied Euclid's algorithm? They're probably not in detail. Euclid's algorithm to find GCD. Please uh, look up okay, and find out what is this GCD, alg uh, this Euclid's algorithm. This algorithm is due to Euclid, uh, who lived, I think, maybe more than 2,000 years ago, and he found this procedure of finding uh, greatest common divisor of two numbers like 2,000 years ago. And the algorithm is very elegant, actually, and it's, it's very efficient. So the time complexity is O of log n. Okay. So I will not go into detail that why it is O of log n. Please figure it out. Um, and, okay. and see that how you can find it out. But since O of log n is, a, is polynomial, right? This O of log n is O of n. N is a polynomial. Therefore, 
there exists a polynomial algorithm that finds whether two numbers are relatively prime or not. And therefore, this problem is in, in, in P. Okay. So there is another problem, which we call primes. Okay, what is this problem? So I will define this word. What is this problem? Prime. <clears throat> <clears throat> so primes consist of all numbers p such that p is a prime number. Okay. So the question is, is this true or not? Anyway, so I will give you some time to think about it. Let's go for a break and we will, uh, I'll see you in 15 minutes time. Uh, I'll, I'll see you at 7.45, okay? And we'll talk about it after we come from the break. Hello, I hope you're all back. Yes. I had a question regarding the final exam. Can you please tell us a bit about the syllabus? Is everything included? Syllabus, uh, I mean, everything is included. Final will be comprehensive. Okay. Everything... And, uh, will it take place uh, physically or virtually? That I'm not completely sure about it because um, initially it was a plan that. Uh, it will be on campus, so I'm not sure that how university decides about it, so they haven't yet decided. Thank you. Okay. So the syllabus is, it's uh, final exam will be comprehensive. Everything that we have done from day one till the last class will be included in final exam. Okay. Okay, so let us come back to our discussion on, on these topics. So, so I, I maybe you, you had some time to think about it. What do you think about this problem? Is prime uh, in P or not? The answer is yes, but it's not obvious that how. So there's a very famous uh, paper in, it was originally published in 2002 by two undergrad students and their advisor. Uh, it is now known as the AKS algorithm. AKS means that uh, these, these are the uh, uh, initials of their names. So it is Agarwal, Kyle, and Saxena. So I think Kyle and Saxena were two students, undergrad students <clears throat> studying at IIT. And Agarwal was their supervisor. Uh, they were undergrad students and they came up with this paper. And the title of the paper was Rhymes is in P. So they wrote it like this. So primes was in capital and is in P. So this was the type. So they proved that primes is in, was, is in P. So it, before that paper, it was not known that whether it is in P or not in P, but, uh, but they proved that it is in P. So when we say that primes is in P, it means that exists an algorithm which uh, checks whether an integer number P is prime or not in polynomial time, right? So, so if you are interested, please go ahead and read that. What is that paper? Anyway, <clears throat> is everything clear so far? Any questions that you need to ask? Sir, so the basic method of checking whether it's uh, any problem is in P or not, we first have to come up with an algorithm, right? Yes. 
and then we then we see uh, how many the number of steps we calculate the number of steps and then according to that we uh, find the polynomial time if it's in polynomial time then uh, we prove that it's in p right yes is this helpful yeah that's pretty much what what it is so you need to construct an algorithm and check what is the time complexity of your solution if the complexity is polynomial then you have a polynomial time algorithm and definitely the problem that it solves is polynomial time uh, polynomial time problem uh, but on the contrary for example you have some problem x we do not know what is this problem and we need to show whether um, we need to show if x is in p or x is not in p so we it's it, let's say x is a very brand new problem uh, you are the first one who discovered it and you want to solve whether uh, you want to solve this problem whether this problem x belongs to p or it does not right so how would you go with that so so your answer suggests that we need to construct either a clearing machine or an algorithm which will solve this problem um, and then we will check what is the time complexity of your algorithm and if the time complexity is, is uh, polynomial, then definitely we will go with this one. But on the contrary, if the time complexity of your algorithm is not polynomial, does that mean X does not belong to P? So if algo A solves X and A runs, in O of 2x, for example, it's exponential, right? Does this mean x does not belong to P? Right, the, the other way we have found, for example, if A solves x and A runs in, for example, O of n squared square for example this definitely implies that x is in p we are sure about it this is perfect but what if the contrary happens things like this happen can we say that x does not belong to p yes or no so according to the definition now definition of what of the class p Class P can, contains all problems which can be solved on a deterministic Turing machine in polynomial time. Yeah, so one to that, uh, if, it's, if A does not run in polynomial time, then it should not belong to P? Yeah, I'm asking it. Does it mean or not? That's the question. Yeah, it, is, it should not belong to P. Okay, anyone with, uh, with a different opinion? So there are 20 students, 19 students are online in the class right now. I think so. I think X does not belong to P. Okay. So we have two students, 17 more. So what do you think? Yes or no? Does this mean X is not in P or, or, or some, something else? Uh, is it necessary to check with DTM? Don't, what do you mean by is it necessary to check with DTM? Can you elaborate more on your question? So there's a question in, in the chat. No, we cannot use NTM. It has to be deterministic, of course. That's the whole point, right? That's the whole point. So that's why I've been stressing that this word deterministic is the key word here. And whenever we talk about class P, we cannot go beyond deterministic. It doesn't matter if it has one tape or two tapes or three tapes or any number of tapes. As long as the machine is deterministic, we are fine. So because we are talking about the complexity and not the exact efficiency of the algorithm, we are, we are fine. <clears throat> so we know we cannot go to uh, non-deterministic. So is there anyone with a different answer? Because there are two answers, 17 are still thinking maybe, uh, that does this mean X is not in P? So two students think that yes, it means that X is not in P. What about others? Is there any different opinion?
I think you should have guessed by now that whenever I ask such questions, uh, the right answer is usually the one that is non intuitive, right? So the intuition says, yes, this is mean, therefore it must be wrong answer. So, so the answer is no. It does not mean X is not mean. Why? Uh, the reason is very, very, very simple because there is no guarantee that when you design A, this A was the most efficient algorithm, right? Somebody can design very inefficient algorithm, right? So when you design an algorithm which solves a problem, it doesn't mean that this, this is the best algorithm because you do not have shown that this, this is the best algorithm unless you have shown that this is the best algorithm uh, and there is no other algorithm which improves it, then that's a different story. But if you haven't, you, if you just have an algorithm, you haven't shown that this is the best for this problem. Therefore, there might exist a better algorithm. Somebody can, can come up with a different algorithm which solves the same problem in, in if, I mean, more efficiently. And then you would, we would see that if that more efficient algorithm is, is polynomial or not, it is, Yes, then we say that the problem is in P, right? So we need to figure out that what is this algorithm? A? Just saying that there exists an algorithm which solves it in exponential does not mean that this is not polynomial. Yes. So then the, how will we find out if something is not in P? That's a very tricky question, actually. That's a very tricky question. It's in fact, very difficult to say that something is not in P. Saying that something is in P is easy. You just come up with an algorithm which, which, solve, which runs in polynomial time and we are done. Saying that something is not in P is, is, a, is a very, very tricky question. And most of the time we do not have any answer to most problems. Right, so we cannot answer it. Because, so I, I, I'll give you one very simple example. And I, I think I, will, I, I already have given such an example before. So remember when I talked about Bogosort? Remember? It's one of the slowest algorithms. It is one of the slowest algorithms. So for example, uh, you already know bubble sort. Right, insertion sort, you know, quick sort, and there are many other sorting algorithms, merge sort and heap sort and, and so many other algorithms, right? So we know that whenever we, have, we are given a list A of N numbers, and you need to design an algorithm which, sort, uh, which sorts this list using comparison, that is you, you compare one element with some other element, so all, so these are all comparison-based algorithms, right? So this is also a comparison-based algorithm. So whenever you have a comparison-based algorithm and the size of the list is n, then it takes at least n log n time. So I, I'm using this, uh, this is called big omega. We will cover it in a, in a different course. So this is just the opposite of big O, right? So big O means that anything less than that, big omega means that anything more than that. So so this is the minimum amount of time required, right? So it means, and this is polynomial, right? This is polynomial. Okay. Bubble sort is O n square, right? Insertion sort is uh, O n square. The traditional approach is O n square, but you can improve it. Quick sort is also O n square most of the time, unless you improve it somehow, and then it becomes n log n and so on. But so these are all um, uh, polynomial time. While bogus sort is exponential, it's not even exponential, it is much more than exponential, right? So, so somebody says that, so let's say somebody does not know anything about sorting and that person comes up with an algorithm. So that person presents this problem of sorting and somebody says that, okay, I know an algorithm and somehow that person comes up with this solution called Bogosort and then you check that Bogosort runs in time exponential. Uh, so you would say, okay, so the sorting problem is not polynomial, which is not correct. Sorting is polynomial. So it means that just because we know a solution which runs in more time than polynomial, 
that doesn't mean that the underlying problem is, is not polynomial, right? So checking whether a problem is P is easy, but checking whether a problem is not in P is a completely different problem, right? And for most questions, for most problems, we have no answer, okay? Because uh, is, it be is it because this is the inherent complexity of the problem that we cannot design an efficient algorithm? or it is our inability to design a better algorithm, right? So we, we cannot do anything with that. That's the problem. Anyway, so let's, let's talk about some other problems which are in P. Uh, so for example, we say that every context-free language is in P. This is very obvious, right? For every context-free language, you can design a Turing machine which uh, which decides it in deterministic time. Uh, similarly, you can say that every regular language is also in P. So this class P contains all regular languages, all context-free languages, and it contains all Turing decidable languages, and so on and so forth. Right? So, so there are many languages which are in P. There are some languages which are definitely not in P, but as I said, it is not easy to show that with they are not in P, okay? So, so when, when we say that A is in P, we know there exists an algorithm or a Turing machine that decides it on, uh, decides it, in det deterministically decides, it, right? But when we say that A is not in P, then it's a really big claim. That's really big claim. So we, most of the time, do not make such claims. When I say that A is not in P, it means that there is no Turing machine which decides it on, there is no deterministic Turing machine which decides it. It's, it's a big claim. We, we cannot try it, right? So for most time, for most problems, we cannot say that. What we can say that A is not known to be in P. So we said that we do not know whether A is in P or not, okay? So let's, let's see some of those problems for which we are not sure whether they are in P or not, okay? So consider a, a directed graph. Consider a directed graph G, okay? So let me, uh, This is from the book. Okay. Suppose this is a, a, a directed graph. Okay. Now, if I ask you, is there a path in this graph G? that visits each and every vertex exactly once. For example, if you start here, this goes there. No. Okay, this is not a good path, so let's figure it out. Uh, let me use a different color. So if you go there and there and there, so let me change the directions. So if you follow this path, which I've drawn in blue, you see that there exists a path in this graph, which is a directed path, which starts at the vertex 
and uh, it visits each and every vertex of this graph exactly once, right? Exactly. So there is no vertex which is not visited and no vertex is visited multiple times. So this question, so this path, this particular path is called Hamiltonian path. I believe that you must have covered this topic in your discrete math course. Have you? No, sir. Okay, this so given a direct... What? No, I said this is the first time I'm hearing about this. Okay. So have you studied graph theory in your discrete maths? No, sir. You haven't studied graphs in your discrete maths? Not that I remember of. I don't think so we have. We studied graphs and um, data structures, but not in discrete mathematics. Okay. Okay, so if you have, if you are given a directed graph, then in a directed graph, and a Hamiltonian path is a path that starts at a vertex, any vertex, and it visits each and every vertex of the graph exactly once. Okay, not more than once, not less than once. So there, so once you finish, so let's say if I say that this is a vertex A and this is vertex B, then starting from A, going all the way till B we have not left any vertex unvisited, right? So every vertex is visited. So we visited each and every vertex and we did not visit each, any vertex multiple times, two or three or four multiple times, right? So if such a path exists that visits each and every vertex of a graph exactly once, we say that that path is called Hamiltonian path. Now I can read, I, I can write this as a problem. I say this is a language Hamiltonian, which given the graph G, which is a directed graph, okay, which asks G has a Hamiltonian path. Okay, so the question is does Hamiltonian belong to P. The answer is, we don't know. We really don't know whether there exists a Turing machine or a deterministic algorithm which can solve, which can decide it, right? We do not know. But there is an interesting thing which is with such graphs or which with this problem. So if I give you this graph G and I give you this solution, this solution. So I say that, okay, this is a graph G and this graph G consists, uh, contains some vertices and there are some edges. And then I designate some edges and I say, I said, okay, let me redraw these, some of these edges with a different color or let me designate these edges somehow differently then I give you this instance of the graph. And I say that all the edges which are drawn in blue is one particular solution. Can you check whether this is a right solution or not? Can you check it? And it can be, can it be checked in, in, efficient, in, 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 in polynomial time? Yes, it can be verified, it can be checked. For example, all you need to do is check that when you visit all these uh, edges, so since this, this is a graph G, and in any graph G, if there are N vertices, you know that the number of edges would be polynomial in terms of N, right? So you can visit each and every edge which is designated in this graph and check whether this belongs to the path or not. If it does, you just keep scanning. And once you scan, you check, is there any vertex in this graph which has been visited multiple times? No. Every vertex is visited exactly one time. Is there any vertex which is not visited at all? No. So you can check this thing very easily in polynomial time. So, so finding a solution is not easy. There is no known algorithm which will find Hamiltonian path in efficient time, right? Efficient in, in polynomial time. But given a solution, it's extremely easy to verify whether that solution is correct or not, right? Therefore, we have a different kind of 
uh, problem. We, we have a kind of problem where it is not easy to find a solution, but given a solution, we can verify whether the solution is right or wrong. Okay. And based on that, we will define a new class. We call it the class NP. Um, excuse me, sir. Okay. Yes. Does this apply to every problem that cannot be solved but can be verified? Yes. Like it's every uh, problem can every problem that is not solvable be verified in polynomial time? I did not say solvable. I said not solvable in in polynomial oh, time yeah, on a deterministic machine. Yes. So every such problem uh, can be verified. Is there? Something that you know? Not every problem, of course. So we say that, see, there are some problems for, for which we can find the solution um, on a deterministic machine in polynomial time. So that problem is definitely class P. But there are some problems for which we do not know if the problem is in P. Uh, but given such a problem, given an instance of the problem, we can verify that a solution is right or wrong in polynomial time on a deterministic machine. We are not using any non-determinism over here, right? So we still have a deterministic Turing machine, but right now we are not finding a solution. We are checking if the solution is right or wrong, right? So such a solution, such a candidate solution is basically called a certificate. So we are verifying, we are verifying whether a certificate is correct or not correct, right? So if for any problem, certificate verification can be done in polynomial time on a deterministic machine, then that problem belongs to NP. Later on, we will see that there are some problems for which even certificate verification cannot be done easily, right? So there are other problems as well. So not all problems are P, not all problems are NP. There are other classes of problems which are even difficult than uh, NP. <clears throat> Okay, so I will define what is class NP in, in a more uh, formal way. Uh, but right now you can imagine that the class NP consists of all those problems for which the verification can be done in polynomial time on a deterministic machine. Okay, and that immediately gives us one very simple and elegant result. And that is the class P is definitely a subset of NP. Because if you can find a solution in polynomial time, you can also verify the solution in polynomial time, right? But if you can verify a solution in polynomial time, it doesn't mean that you can find a solution in polynomial time. So by definition, every problem that is in P is also in NP. So we know that if this is the class P, then class NP is something like this. So P is contained within NP. So P and NP are not disjoint. Class P is contained entirely in class NP. Every problem that is in class P is by default in class NP. Okay, because for, for any problem in P, we can find, we can find a solution uh, on a deterministic machine in polynomial time. So if we can find a solution in, in polynomial time, we can also verify the solution in polynomial time. So for every problem that is in P, that problem is by default in class NP. This is for sure, this is known. What is unknown is if NP is also a subset of P. This is unknown. And if you show that this is the case, you actually prove that the class P is equal to NP, right? And this is a million dollar question. And when I say million dollar, it's not, um, uh, it is basically literally million dollar question. So if you, if you or anyone can solve this question uh, and you show that P is equal to NP or you show that P is not equal to NP, then you will definitely win a million dollars. So there is, a, there is an institute of mathematics uh, which identified some problems. So remember in 1900, uh, Hilbert came up with a list of problems. Similarly, at the end of 20th century, in 2000 or 99, uh, there was a list of problems, I think seven problems. Uh, the, these problems are identified. So these problems are at the intersection. Some problems are purely math. Some problems are in, in the intersection of math and computer science. Uh, and, and on top of that list, this problem P equal to NP is, is, the, is the top problem. 
So if anyone who can solve this problem, either in positive, positive direction or negative direction, if you say that yes, P is equal to NP or P is not equal to NP, then that institute will pay you a million dollars, right? And not only that, you will get money, you will be extremely famous for that. So since then, since uh, Turing's time, not exactly, maybe since 1960s and early 70s, people have been trying to solve this problem. And all attempts have been unsuccessful so far. So we do not know whether, um, so we know this is true, but we do not know if the other way is true or not. If you can show, fine, uh, but, but nobody has shown it so far. So if you can show that P is equal to NP, uh, then you will be famous and you will also get a million dollars. So if any one of you in, in this class uh, happen to solve it, uh, please don't forget me. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Sir, okay. uh, is it possible to determine if a particular problem is not in the class NP? Uh, again, uh, that, that's basically, it's a tricky question, right? Uh, so we do not answer this question this way. Uh, what we, uh, how do we answer it? We define more classes. And we say that, okay, so we will cover it in, in detail uh, later on, but let me give you a quick uh, response to this. So, so suppose this is the class P, right? And once we uh, dealt with class P, uh, we knew that, uh, I mean, we knew that uh, there are so many problems which are in class P, right? And then we uh, found that there are some problems which are outside class P. And we say that they are in P, okay? So there are so many problems here which are in P. There are some problems, actually there are many problems which are not in P. I mean, or at least we do not know whether they are in P or not, but they are definitely in NP. Similarly, we will find there are some problems for which we cannot answer this question whether they are in NP or not. Uh, but before we go there, what we do, we further classify this class NP. And we designate some of these problems as special problems in the class NP. And we will cover it in detail and we say those problems are NP complete, NPC. So all those problems which you call NPC are special problems in class NP, okay? And they are special in a sense that if you can solve any of these NPC problems, any of these NPC problems, there are many NPC problems actually. So by 1970s, uh, there, there was a book, um, uh, NP, NP problems. Uh, it, it was by author Johnson who died recently. Uh, he published in 1970s a book uh, about NP completeness. And in that book at that time, I think there were around more than 200 or 250 problems which were identified to be NP complete or NPC problems. So these NPC problems are special problems. So, so we say that these are NPC problems. So if you can solve any of these NPC problems, okay? So we know a solution of all of NPC problems by, by, by saying that if you can solve those NPC problems, if you can, if anyone can solve any NPC problem, in polynomial time. on a deterministic machine. Okay, if anyone can find it out, then actually the class NP will collapse. Okay, this class NP will collapse and it will imply that P is equal to NP. Okay. So NPC problems are special problems in a sense that they are the representative of the entire class of NP. So if anyone can come up with a solution uh, for any of the NPC problems, which runs in polynomial time on a deterministic machine, uh, then uh, this class NP collapses into the class P. So the boundaries of P and NP will vanish. Every problem that is in P will be in NP and every problem that is in NP will be in P. So we will have just one class rather than two classes. And that will actually imply that P is equal to NP. And that will also give you a $1 million as well. So these are the special problems. Then there are some other problems, uh, which we call NPH problems or NP hard problems. 
which are outside class NP. Okay, so we can, in, yes, the answer is yes, we can say that it is, uh, it, it is possible for us to check if a problem is NP or not, right? So there are problems which are outside uh, the class NP. And they are also, again, special problems because if you have any, if you have solution to any of these problems, again, the class P and NP collapses, even though these problems are outside uh, the class NP, they are outside of the boundary. But if you can solve any of these problems uh, and, and your solution runs in polynomial time on a deterministic machine, then again, that will imply that this, this boundary of P and NP collapses. Okay, so I will give you some examples, very simple examples. Suppose I give you a number n, okay? Suppose I give you a number n. To test whether whether n is prime or not is in P, right? So, I, I just told you that primes is in P right now. So previously it was unknown to be in P or NP, but now uh, that, that class is also called NPI. So NPI means that NP intermediate for all those problems for which we do not have any answer, whether they go to P or NP, we, we place them in, a, in an intermediate class NPI. So testing whether a number is prime or not uh, is P, right? So we, we know a polynomial time algorithm which can solve it. Uh, but this polynomial time algorithm does not give us the ingredients of this number, okay? So what do I mean by ingredient? For example, I know two is a prime number, three is a prime number, five is a prime number, seven is a prime number, nine is not a prime number, 11 is a prime number, 13 is a prime number, and so on and so forth. So whenever we have a prime number, we know that a prime number uh, has, has no factors other than itself and one, right? So a prime number has just two factors. One is one and the other is itself, right? So it doesn't have any other factor. Every other number, which is not prime, which is now, which is called composite number is made up of prime numbers, right? Now, suppose you take some prime number P1, a big prime number here, let's call it P. And another prime number Q, okay? We do not know from where, from this, long list of new numbers. So P is a prime, Q is a prime, okay? Both P and Q are big. And when I say big, it means that let's say if you represent these numbers in binary, uh, they both are like, uh, they required 128 bits or maybe 256 bits or 512 bits okay. or 1000 bits. So these are usually, they're, they're really, really big numbers. They're prime numbers, but they are really big. Now, I can multiply this P with Q and I get a number N. And let's call it R, okay? So P is a prime number, it's a big prime number. Q is a prime number, it's really a big prime number. And I multiply these two numbers and I get R. R is, is definitely not a prime number because it is made up of, made up of uh, two prime numbers. So therefore it is a composite number and not prime, right? Now. Now, suppose you do not know what is P, what, you do not know what is Q, I just give you R. And I ask you this question, is R prime? You will be able to answer this question because finding whether this number is, is prime or not is, is, is in P, even though it is not an efficient algorithm, but you will find, figure it out in some amount of time that whether R is prime or not. But even the answer will not tell you what are the ingredients of, of this R? What are the product? What are the two numbers or three numbers or whatever number of numbers that we have, which we multiply to get R, right? We do not know, right? But if I give you P and I give you Q and I give you R, and I tell you that R is a number such that R is equal to PQ, can you verify? You can verify it very quickly. Right? Finding, for, so given R, finding P and Q is extremely difficult, right? Depending on how big this P and Q are, it is extremely difficult to find P and Q. By just looking at R. 
But if I give you P and Q and R and I tell you that, does multiplying P by Q give you R or not? You can do it very easily, right? You can write a simple program which multiplies P with Q and checks whether R is equal to product of P and Q. And if it is, you say yes. If it is not, you say no. So verification over here is extremely simple. But finding out what are the ingredients is not easy, right? So we have two problems here. Finding whether a number is composite is, is very similar to finding that whether a number is, is uh, whether a number is prime or not. It's the opposite, right? But on more, but more than that, we are also looking at the factorization of, of a number. So what are the factors of those numbers? Anyway, we will we will go into detail. So you can you can clearly uh, create a connection here with the class P and class N P. Finding whether a number is in is in is, is prime or not is in P, uh, but finding whether finding the the ingredients the uh, factors of a number is definitely right now it's not in P. So nobody knows whether it is in P or not. Okay. Anyway. <clears throat> So I gave you a, a definition of class NP. So class NP is a class for which uh, it's a class of problems and class of languages such that there exists a verifier. Uh, there exists a certificate which can be verified on a deterministic machine in polynomial time. So, so that language will go into class NP. So I will give you the formal definition uh, in, in the next class. I've already uploaded the slides uh, for these lectures. Uh, so you can find a definition over there and uh, I will stop the, the class here. Uh, so if you have any questions so far, please let me know. And uh, otherwise we will end the class. Any questions? Um, sir, how many more classes do we have? Uh, today is 27th. So we will have it on Thursday as well as Saturday. At least two more classes, at least. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, when will we come to know about our P set marks? Uh, I'm not sure, but I'll try as soon as possible. Okay, sir. thank you. Okay, quiz grade I will upload, I mean, in a day or two. Quizzes are easy to grade. Yes, any other question related to whatever that we have covered uh, today? Yes, I can tell you what are the important topics for the final and the important topics are chapter one to chapter seven, except for chapter six. Yeah, everything is important. Okay. So final exam will be comprehensive, right? Everything that we have covered uh, is included. You already have the uh, lecture notes, you already have the lecture slides, and you also have the access to the book. Uh, and, and at the end of uh, chapter, uh, there are so many problems at the, uh, I mean, for, for, for practice. Sir, yes. sir, we did not cover uh, GNFA and Chomsky. Yeah, so whatever that we did not cover, weeks. yeah, whatever that we did not cover is not included. Unless I explicitly said that we are not covering it, but it is included. So that there are only a couple of such things. Uh, and mainly they are uh, more like proof. So I said that the proof is included, but I'm not covering it because it's easy or it, it's, it's, it's uh, trivial. So all those are included, but everything that we did not cover is not included. Uh, will the exam be physical? I mean, in person on campus or online, I'm not sure. So IBA will announce it very soon. And um, so most probably it will be on uh, campus, but I'm not sure. So can I please check my email after class? Okay, I will check. Yes, any other question? Okay, no questions then I think we can end it here. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you again on Thursday. Thank you, sir. Take care, Khuda, first.